Hi everybody, welcome to South Rice at Christian Fellowship. Today's service is going to be a little different to our normal service as Darren is unwell, so you're getting what we managed to put together without him. So we will have matters for prayer, a Bible reading and a talk, but no songs. If you want to sing, go back to the previous services and sing along with James or Winnie. Let's kick off with some words from Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 3. In the past God spake to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. Eternal Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we bow and worship Jesus. We recognise that he is supreme above all things. He is the radiance of your glory, full of grace and truth. We remind ourselves that he came and lived among us, teaching us all the good things that you wanted to tell us. And then he laid down his life that we might live. And he rose again and returned to you and sent his Holy Spirit to be among us. So much we have received from your hand and we worship you and we rejoice this morning that Jesus is raised to the highest place in heaven, a place which is above every place. He is in the centre, he is the centre one and we worship him and we worship you, our Lord God, and we praise your name. Bless us as we worship you and as we listen to your word in Jesus name. Amen. Hi everybody, how you doing? God's Word describes the church as the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. In normal circumstances we think of that as we meet together for worship and prayer and fellowship. But it is true today, even though you have to be at least two metres apart and generally haven't met up with most of the body for weeks, we are still the body of Christ and each one of us is part of that body. Each one of us has a function which is vital to the church and to tell the good news to the community around us. So when we pray, pray that together we may discover how to be united while apart to be able to share the good news while isolated from our family, friends and neighbours. Krishna says, I just want to th say thank you to everyone for their prayers. It is good to know that my family has been surrounded by prayers and we are all safe. Also, thank you for respecting my request for no calls at the beginning of this, as it was a big shock to us as a family. It was unexpected and we were overwhelmed by calls from the extended family. We celebrated my brother's life on Tuesday at Hendon with a small service which was different as we were all two metres apart from each other. Please continue to pray for my nephew who has lost both parents now and that we may be able to support him at this time. Anne says, pray, please pray for my friend's 20 year old son who has recently become a Christian and is having suicidal thoughts. Please pray for his mind to be re healed. Derek asks us to pray because he hasn't been out of the flat since lockdown and he has a hospital appointment on Tuesday and, and he's frightened of getting the lurgy. So we need to pray for him for safety as he goes to the hospital and gets all these tests that he needs done. So let's pray. We love you, O oh Lord, our strength. 
you are our rock, our fortress, our deliverer in whom we take refuge. You are our shield and the means of our salvation. So we call upon you, Jesus, who is worthy of praise, and we are saved. We rejoice in the salvation you brought in dying on the cross for our sins and rising again to conquer death. We thank you for your presence day by day, through the, you, the Holy Spirit, stimulating us to love and good works. We come to you confident that you are here, listening and moving among us. We pray for each of us in this church, kept apart by circumstances of this pandemic, but united in one not, not, not mind to bless your holy name. Help us to be united in mind and purpose and find ways of sharing this wonderful news of salvation we have to others. We thank you that you have blessed our sister Krishna in her time of grief. We continue to pray for them as they grieve. In particular, we pray for Krishna's nephew, that you will bless him and keep him. We pray that he will not be overwhelmed by his loss, but he will have the courage to face the world without parents, but with good family and friends. We pray for Anne's friend's son, we pray that you will anoint him with the Holy Spirit and renew his mind so that he may have good and positive thoughts and move on from the difficult place he is in at present. We pray for Derek, anxious about going out for the first time and having a hospital appointment. We pray that you will be his bubble and his personal protection equipment and everything else he needs, that he may have a safe time there and that you may... Uh, bless him and that all the tests will be very positive for him. We continue to pray for our key workers in our community carrying out their dirt duties in difficult conditions. Protect and guard them, particularly Gabriella, Mary, Sam, Takeshaw and Winnie. We pray for you to eradicate COVID-19. We pray for the many who are suffering with it now. Bring healing we pray for the vast numbers of people who are not able to protect themselves due to overcrowding and poor sanitation. We pray for good solutions to be found to provide the essentials of life for all humans wherever they live. We pray for our government that the ending of the development of Department of International Development will not deprive the poor of much needed relief and support. We continue to pray for wise decisions in every aspect of government, managing the pandemic in particular. We praise you and we bless you, for you are our saviour, our redeemer and friend. You have loved us with an everlasting love and we thank you for all your goodness to us. We bring our requests to you in the name of Jesus, because you, O oh Lord, are our righteousness, our advocate in heaven, and we know that your eyes are ever on your people. Amen. Hi there. I thought we'd start out in the garden because we're all stuck at home, limited by endless restrictions. We've got long hours of work. We don't really know what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, you've probably got limited amount of income. You're very anxious about the future. You don't know when this pandemic is going to end and what's going to happen next. Well, in that case, this reading this morning is just for you. We're reading from Genesis chapter 15. So here it is. This word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, O oh, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who inherit will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son will come from your own body to be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up to the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So will your offspring be. 
Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought these to him, cut them in two and arranged them in halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. A thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet received its full measure. When the sun set and darkness had fallen, a smoking pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants, descendants I will give this land from the river Egypt to the great river the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Canaanites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephazites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites and Jebusites. Hi there. Well, you've moved inside because the neighbour's mowing the lawn. I didn't think you wanted that distraction. I hope you watched last week's talk by James because it makes sense of the opening statement in this passage that's made by God. Abraham had made a choice to give Melchizedek 10% of all he had and he'd refused to take any loot from the battle he just won. So he had fought a battle and comes home with less than he started out. He's in addition, he's probably deflated after the excitement of the chase, the battle, the victory, and meeting the kings of Sodom and Salem. But then he has a vision from God. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. So fed up with your own company? Tired of being isolated from everyone else? Short of cash to spend anyway? God says to you this morning, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. The shield can mean two things. It speaks of a protection. That's what a shield is for. You use it in battle to guard, ward off any attack. But it also speaks of sovereignty. And the connection is that the godly purpose of government is to protect people. So God is saying to you this morning, do not be afraid, and you can put your own name there. I am your sovereign. I am your personal protection, your very great reward. So say it back to me and put your own name in there. Do not be afraid. I am your sovereign. I am your personal protection, your very great reward. One of the reasons why we are keen to keep our worship services going online is because we think you need to be reminded that this about this as often as possible. It's easy to watch the news and get depressed, to stare at the walls and wish you were somewhere else, to be fed up with your expenses, swallowing your income before your eyes. Although in these days, invisibly as direct debits and standing orders eat up your bank balance. But you were created for more than that. 
you were created to have any relationship with God and to enjoy him forever. The world tells us that money matters. God says relationships matter. And the most important relationship you can have is with him. He is your very great reward. Get that clear and other relationships can develop properly. You see, understanding that God has forgiven you by grace changes the way you react to others. God's love develops love in our heart that must overflow to others. Now, there's been a lot of hate in our streets in the news. And we must understand that black lives do matter because everyone is created by and loved by God. In Christ, there is no Jew, nor Greek, nor safe, nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. That has to work out in our daily living, in particular to those who are apparently not like us. Whether it's the sort of housing they've got, the income level, the type of job, the colour of their skin, the country of their origin, those things are not important. What matters is that God expresses his love through you to love everyone else. There is no place in our thinking for prejudice against anyone. If the papers say to you a group is evil, remember that we are all sinners but saved by grace. It is a sober fact that we are judged by our treatment of immigrants. The Bible is quite clear that the measure of righteousness is how we treat the widows, the orphaners, orphans and the foreigners. God is your great reward because he loves you with an everlasting love. Jesus died for you while you were an enemy of his father. So let's say it again. Do not be afraid, Phil. I am your sovereign. I am your personal protection, your very great reward. You cannot be a loser because you have Jesus. But faith is not without its difficulties. Abraham had no dead children, and the event of his death, his entire wealth went to Eliezer of Damascus. But God had promised him not just a child, but innumerable descendants. And it says here, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. But faith is a struggle. And what happens in these chapters is not Abraham firm and forward, but vacillating, struggling, trying to work out what these great and precious promises mean. Yet in spite of Abraham's wobbly faith, and it was really wobbly, we have this statement. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is a key Old Testament verse, which is interpreted in the New Testament. Believing is critical to our status with God. Not our personal righteousness, which is rubbish, but the righteousness of Jesus, which he gives us by grace through faith. And that point is made clearly here. Abraham is not counted righteous because he is innocent before God but because he believed God. You are not righteous because of how good you are, but because you believe in Jesus. And if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, sadly, you have no standing before God. Now you can turn that around by putting your faith and trust in Jesus and receiving his salvation and being restored to the new life that God wants to give you. Abraham, as I said the other week, is important to Jews, Muslims and Christians. For Christians, he is the shining example of faith leading to righteousness. It is so important that he's referred to three times in the New Testament. Time, unfortunately, doesn't allow us to explore those passages, so I'm setting you some homework. That's the danger of having a teacher speak. I want you to read Romans chapter 4. 
Galatians chapter 3, James chapter 2. And as a bonus, what Jesus had to say about Abraham in Matthew 3, verses 8 to 10. You see, God is a faithful, compassionate and merciful God. And when we look at what God does in this passage, we see his consideration of Abraham's humanity at its best. What do I mean? Well, this strange ritual of covenant making. God does it to show Abraham he means business. In Genesis chapter 1, God says, and it's so. And the same God has already said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. He's already said in Ab- it to Abraham in Genesis 13, lift up your eyes from where you look and look north and south and east and west. All the land I give you I w- w- f- will be for your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. And anyone who can count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land that I'm giving you. He has already said in this passage to him, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But still, Abraham, being human, is asking questions, trying to work it out. In fact, he's just like you and me, always trying to piece together the bits of information we have to make sense of it. So God sets his next statement to Abraham in the context of a formal covenant ritual. The ritual may be strange, but we understand these sorts of rituals. Most commonly in marriage, where we set out simple vows into a large event, larger event to emphasise their significance. After all, basically, all that the two parties say, the husband and wife to be, is, I am free to marry, I am willing to marry you, I marry you, job done. But we put that in the context and make a special event out of it because it's very important to us, this vow of marriage. Buying a house likewise, two parties, the buyer and the seller. Signing papers that they agree and transfer the property ownership of the property. All has to be done in a formal, legal sense. And the problem with that is it just takes a long, long time. God could have just said it. He is the creator whose word is unchangeable. And he will not change his mind. But for Abraham's sake, he initiates a ritual of, to emphasise his commitment. Well, a somewhat strange ritual involving a heifer, a goat, a ram, a th- each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon, which are butchered and the animals cut in half and a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appears and passes between the pieces. To understand this, we need to research covenant. In the Hebrew, the word for covenant, bereth, is derived from another meaning, meaning to cut meat. So the word itself comes from the ritual. The word covenant comes from the word, the ritual of cutting the meat in half. That's what you do in those days, to make a covenant. So God is explaining to Abraham that he's making a special covenant with him. Again, if you want to explore this idea of covenant further, I will include some of the references about covenant in my website and you can look them up, but we're not going to go into them now. When we have communion, we refer to the new covenant in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and Luke 22, 10, we hear these words referring to the cup of red wine. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
It is a reminder that God has made a covenant of grace through the death of Jesus. A covenant is a bit like a contract, except it's lopsided. God offers you salvation, which you receive in repentance by believing in the name of Jesus. You receive forgiveness, new life, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and eternal life. In exchange, you offer yourself in his service to live the life of faith. So going back to Abraham, what new thing did God offer Abraham? Well, the answer is a prophecy covering the next few hundred years. God tells Abraham that his descendants will be slaves for 400 years. And that he will bring Abraham's descendants out of Egypt and they will live in the land we know of as Israel today. That's how God answers Abraham's question. O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know how I will gain possession of it? The short answer is, it's a long story. And if you want to know the rest of the story, you've got to read the rest of Genesis all the way through to at least 2 Samuel and probably go on for the whole of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, it will take you a few days. The important thing to get out of this is that God's word is utterly reliable. Secondly, the prophecy is not comfortable. God tells the truth. He does not promise an easy life, health, wealth, influence. In fact, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. But there is a rider to cheer you up. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. That is why this talk is called moving towards maturity. Mature faith knows that life is full of hardships and difficulties, but God has a plan for our good. We have a future and a hope. For the present, our sins are forgiven. And we have begun a new eternal life. We have the Holy Spirit to guide and encourage us. And we have a future. We know that death is not the end, but the gateway of spending eternity in heaven with Jesus. So we are not dismayed by COVID-19, although it can terrify us. Leaving the EU at the same time may be a disaster, but our investment is not in stocks and shares. Even the essentials of life, our investment is in heaven. Our world is in chaos. Spending money it hasn't got to deal with a pandemic it cannot control. Led by people who have no idea how to lead. But we have Jesus. He is our rock in times of trouble. Jesus calls you to believe as Abraham did. Knowing full well that it's not a quick fix, but an eternal certainty not looking at the circumstances or even the road ahead but as it says in hebrews 12 verse 2 fixing our eyes on jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of god consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Do not lose heart. Stay the course. Endure lockdown, the economic chaos, the restless around us. God is your shield and your very great reward. If you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. One day you will be with him forever. Now you have the Holy Spirit to cheer and to guide you. Let's pray. Father, we've taken the words uh, that you said to Abraham to ourselves. We remind ourselves that you are our shield and our very great reward. That you are going to protect us and you are the one that we look to. So Father, teach us not to be afraid. Teach us to get our heads round 
the important things, which is knowing our sins forgiven and our hope of heaven. Let us get into context the COVID-19, Brexit, the international chaos, the stresses and strains and protests that are going on around us and help us to see that our faith is not grounded on any of those but on the certain and sure hope that you have said something and therefore it's going to happen. Father, we bless you and we praise you for our salvation. We thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for us. We place our hand in your hand and we grasp it firmly and say, yes, we trust you. Whatever the circumstances look like around us, we trust you to be on leading us on the right path to eternal life. Thank you, Father. We praise you for the glorious future we have. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen.